here, this is from Jack Sapkowski and his diversity curve. Things take off like crazy, diversification increases, and it's nice to see that it seems like we're at a point where we have more and more species through time. But sooner or later, this is going to turn around. And the question is becoming increasingly interesting to many of us is when will it turn around? When will we stop having diversification and have a reversal of it? Oops. So we really must ask, how will diversity on Earth come to an end? I put this in this talk later, accidentally, but I want to start out with accidentally because there's really two fates to any of us. Fate number one is as that doctor looks at us and we get older and older and older, that we live to old age and we finally die off. But fate number two is coming out of the doctor's office, we're hit by a bus and we're squashed flat and that's it, it's over. And those are the two possibilities every one of us in this room realizes there, no one's immune from that accident. It could happen to any of us in this room with the size of this audience. Some number of people here will die prior to what the insurance companies say you will. It will happen. And perhaps that's the fate of habitable planets. Two fates, they die of old age or they die accidentally. So let's deal with the second first and see what could cause the diversity on Earth to come to an end. Well, we know that one of these, comet asteroid impact, we potentially we know of other supernova, other mass extinction causes, or perhaps we do it. Perhaps with all our nuclear bombs released at the same time, we could cause the ultimate end of life. I think the bacteria still survive, but nevertheless, we could come close. So the causes of mass extinctions that we know of in the past, and I want to talk about these because any mass extinction from the fossil record had the potential to sterilize the planet. It seems that this is the way a planet dies off. A mass extinction was just as bigger than the others. Asteroid impact is the one we know. The possible ones are climate change, change in atmospheric chemistry, supernova again, planetary old age, cessation of plate tectonics, that'll do it, and us, or the rise of any other intelligent civilization. And it could be that this group of causes can be used for any planet. We know from the fossil record, once again, looking at Sukowski's diversity curve, that there have been times when diversity here shown in the number of marine families plotted against time. From the Cambrian, we had this nice rise, a steady state, but a series of crashes, and the most important being shown through here. We'll come back to this one. A rise again, and then another great crash here. This is the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous that we know best, and let's talk about it a little bit. We know it best because it's the most sensational, not just for how it happened, but for who it killed, the end of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, everybody's favorite iconic creatures, Hollywood's favorites, go out suddenly, we now know. And we know why. In the 1980s, the celebrated paper by Walter Alvarez and his group, through the analysis of rocks shown here in Italy, this is Alessandro Montanari, one of the grad students on the site at the time of the 1980s, looking at these peculiar white beds interbedded between pink limestones. This bed, this last white bed, is the very top of the Cretaceous period. And there's a very thin clay in here that shows an enormous change in its fossil content. Now, these beds don't have dinosaurs. In fact, they were deposited at the bottom of a three-kilometer ocean. It's so deep, it's so far from shore, the only thing being deposited are these, skeletons of single-celled plankton, planktonic foraminifera in this particular case. And that last white bed, if you take a thin section of it and polish it and identify it, has over 50 species of planktonic forams within it. But the next bed above it has one species. And look at the size difference, the morphology difference. Clearly a catastrophe has happened within the plankton of the world. It's very hard to study how quickly dinosaurs go extinct by studying dinosaurs, but it's relatively easy to study mass extinction by examining microfossils, which can be sampled in huge numbers. The statistics favor you. What the Alvarezes found was this. They were looking at trace elements, and they studied iridium in this particular case. They were looking at, to use iridium as a method of examining how fast the clay between these two beds was deposited, thinking that cosmic dust coming out of the sky would do so at a constant rate. 
they were going to use an iridium measure to estimate the thickness versus age of this clay layer. And what they found is that it went off scale just in this bed. And this is where Louis Alvarez, the great genius and Nobel Prize winner, suggested to his son that could only be if the Earth were hit by a very, very large impactor, comet or asteroid. From the size of this, they were able to estimate the size of the impactor, 10 kilometers. And they came up with a two-part hypothesis. Number one, we were hit. And number two, the hit caused the mass extinction. And from that paradigm change within the science of geology and paleontology and astronomy, and for the first, first time, we had a really good explanation for mass extinction. A hit, environmental change, causes this, the drop-off in species. Well, this is really a visible clue to what's happening. Rockhammer for scale. This is a different one of these KT boundary sites. This one is in Stevens Quint in Denmark. But what we find are white chalk. And within this white chalk, there's lots of fossils, big fossils. They're still marine. And then the white chalk comes to a sudden end. And there's a one millimeter thick red layer here. It is from this one millimeter thick layer right here that the iridium comes out of. And other curious things, glassy spherules are found here, and shock quartz grains are found here. And then the next succeeding bed is black. And the reason it's black is that all the white shown here is because this sedimentary sea bottom is made up of the skeletons of untold billions of tiny plankton. And the plankton are totally wiped out. And the only thing falling on that seabed are rock particles. Total death to the world. But it's not complete sterilization because, look, it starts getting white again. And we find this whiteness is from new species of plankton, new types of chalk. So this is about 10,000 years of time in through here. And it illustrates to us that we had a normal, happy, everyday Mesozoic world. Crash comes the meteorite. Bits and pieces of Mexico come on a permanent European vacation. And then we have a new world starting. We know now the crater is here. We know the giant impact waves covered much of Texas in through here. You know, it's funny, I was giving this talk in Italy about a month ago. There were 3,000 Italians showed up to hear about the end of the world. I was doing a simultaneous translation. And at the time, I said, the impact wave at that time would have wiped out George Bush's ranch. And I said, gee, it's almost a shame it wouldn't hit again. <laughs> I got a standing ovation. And, <laughs> It scared me. I mean, these guys, these Italians, very spooky. The, the degree of anti-Americanism in Europe now is very spooky. So here's an artist rendition of what happens. Now, this is not just a theoretical construct. This 10-kilometer object kills off over 50% of species on the planet. It leaves a 200-kilometer crater but that's just a 10-kilometer object hitting a giant Earth. That's a pretty small hitting a very big, creating a huge extinction. But there's a lot bigger stuff out there in space. This mass extinction wasn't even the biggest of them all. The biggest of them all is this one at the end of the Permian. In 1980 to 1990, it was realized if one mass extinction could have been caused by impact, perhaps all the mass extinctions could be caused by impact. And we began to think that the death of planets perhaps could only be caused by gigantic impact, big comets coming in. Well, let's go back in time now. Let's move back from 65 million year old rocks to 250 million year old rocks. And I always throw this slide in to, to remind myself this is a Boer graveyard in South Africa. We now moved from Italy to the heart of the Karoo Desert in South Africa. And I've had the privilege to work there for 10 years now. These three graves harbor four bodies. And they all died in a very short period from 1896 to about 1898. And there's mom and dad are in one. Two sons are shown here. There's no cause of death linked if you go back to the nearest town, a place called Graffinet, in the records, there's no cause of death. We just know this family's eliminated in about two years. Oh, maybe it's the British. This was the Boer War. But we don't know. We just have a mass extinction of a family, a termination. You can't figure it out. It's 100 years old, no idea what caused it. And the reason I show this is coincidentally, they built their graveyard 
right on top of a bound.